Hey, this is Tandy with Common Ground Alaska. I'm so glad you've decided to join us today. Um, I have had I have the opportunity to speak with Melissa Reimers today. She is from Reimers Microfarm. And um, what Melissa specializes in is growing sheep in Alaska. And um, I'm really, really excited to hear all of her, all of the sheep stories and, um, but really to kind of dig in and, and learn what all is involved in growing sheep um, here in this, here in the North for sure. So Melissa, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah, I'm so glad that you invited me. Absolutely. So let's start um, just learning a little bit about you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your farm, Melissa? Sure. So we've been raising sheep and lamb for about six or seven years now. And it started out as my girls' 4-H project. And they wanted to raise lamb. And I was, we had an opportunity to get some, a couple of ewes from Fairbanks. And so the gal brought those down and we started our, started our sheep project. And of course, as they got older, they moved on to bigger and better things. Well, maybe not better, but they moved on to bigger things. And so they, you know, started raising beef or whatever, which is fine. But I really took a liking to the sheep I never would have never would have guessed I would have had sheep you know in my 40s or whatever but here I am and I absolutely love it I think they're just the greatest little economical farm animal I that's really fun so Melissa were you raised um in the ag world were you raised on a farm or not really. I was raised in Oregon and uh, had a horse. My grandparents had a farm. They had beef cows and um, wasn't really involved with any of that. I was like 100% horse obsessed. You can ask my mom. I was like horse on the brain. And then we moved up here, brought my horse with me. And I just wasn't really, other than horses, I wasn't really involved with any of the the ag other than you know trying to get hay and that kind of thing for my horse I wasn't really involved with any of that but then when the girls got into middle school I heard about the 4-H junior market livestock auction and that's that was really the beginning of the end <laughs> I think that's really fun that you started with sheep for your girls and now your girls are um, grown or are growing. They're just about ready to to fly the coop on their own. And, and here you are still with sheep. That's really fun. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just getting warmed up. Like people are like, oh, you know, when you get out of sheep. And I was like, oh, no. I love no, that. I'm not getting out of sheep. I love sheep. Okay. So, um, so why? Tell us, let's get into the why first. Why do you enjoy, specific to Alaska, why do you enjoy growing sheep up here? <clears throat> well, I've not really, I've not grown them anywhere else, so I don't really have any other knowledge to pull from, but I've learned over the years the advantages of having them. They obviously carry around their own insulation, so you never really have to worry about your sheep getting cold, although this last week we had already sheared and the sheep got cold, so they're all, if you looked out in the barnyard right now, they are all cobbled together in these weird coats that I was able to find full coats, calf coats, other things to like try and keep them warm because usually you can shear this time of year and you don't have to worry about them getting cold. But anyway, they carry around their own insulation. They're pretty ideal for a small farmstead. Like if you're in a, we're in a subdivision, we don't have a giant farm. We only have a couple acres and the sheep only occupy maybe half an acre like in the winter time because I'm I, obviously there's no grazing we don't really have a lot of grazing anyway but they're they're not really hard on the ground mm. like they're not going to tear it up I mean it it will wear but they don't tear it up like say cows or even horses and um they're not escape artists like goats so they're pretty easy to keep in they can be kind of noisy, but, you know, usually, I mean, chickens are noisy, cows moo, so they can be kind of noisy. But anyway, I think they're really, 
good for Alaska. Well, I think that makes sense. A packing around their own insulation is a good selling point. <laughs> That's a good one. So do you, what knowledge do you have about breeds? What, what breeds do well here? Or if not specific to breeds, what do you look for in a sheep that's going to do well in Alaska versus say, say the lower 48? I'm not aware of anything that wouldn't do well here. I know people that have Katahdins, which are, are hair sheep. So they don't have the, you know, the big fluffy wool, like, um, like when people think of sheep, um, i most of them, they get pretty fuzzy. They're pretty warm. And so they're, I mean, I've heard of them, you know, being up pretty far north and pretty extreme temperatures. So I can't think of any that wouldn't do well here. Okay. My experience is mostly with meat sheep. So there might be more sheep that are more fragile or not as disease resistant. I'm not sure, but we've had really good luck. Okay. So it almost seems like maybe sheep are more made for the North. And maybe if you lived in Florida or Alabama or someplace that gets really hot, that's more when maybe sheep wouldn't be quite as resilient. Um, I mean, that seems to make sense. I don't know that that's true, but um, okay. So you said that you're, you um, are more familiar with meat sheep. So let's talk a little bit about what um, what are the purposes of sheep on the farm? There's wool and there's meat. And then I just learned from you, there's also milk. There's milk production with them. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yep. Um, so you can have fiber sheep that are specifically grown to be like a fine wool. This is something that like along the lines of Merino or um, some of those other breeds that you know, are not grown for meat, although they are eaten, because obviously if you have excess of whatever, you're going to have mm -hmm. meat. And um, so there's those that are like fine wool, and then there's basically meat. Mm -hmm. So it's like um, Suffolk, Hamp, you know, I have friends that have like Icelandics and stuff. If I mean, they grow them for dual purpose, triple purpose. So, I mean, you can do almost anything with them. Okay. And even like, even our sheep, they're a coarse wool. There's still uses for that wool. So it's not just, oh, well, you only grow wool, you know, that's the nice, well, there's uses for all types of wool. You just have to find the, find the right place to plug it in. Okay. That makes sense. So you can have, it's like a chicken um, or even a cow. You can have dual purpose cows. So it makes sense that there would be dual purpose sheep too. So, um, so um, for you though, you um, really are kind of in the meat and milk industry or side of things, I should say. Is that right? So yeah. I want to talk for a minute about, um, we can talk about, well, first of all, with meat, um, do you sell, you just sell lambs. Is that right? Um, and people take them and, and they either, do they grow them up and then butcher them or do they take the lambs and have those butchered? I grow them to butcher weight and then I sell by, I sell them by the hanging weight. And so I have someone come out to the farm and slaughter the lambs here. Okay. And then, then they go to the butcher and then our clients pick them up from the butcher. Okay. And it's technically lamb that they're buying, not sheep. Is that right? Correct. So what would butcher weight be or what would hanging weight be? And about how old is that? Is that sheep? Hanging weight uh, generally for ours are anywhere between 70 and 90 pounds. We have run as high as like a hundred pounds. And um, it's usually around six, seven months old is when they get processed. Okay. That makes sense. And let's talk about your milk shares. So you said that you do flock shares. Is that is that like the the sheep version of of milk of like the cow milk shares? Yep, pretty much. Just like that. <laughs> okay. So what's the difference between if you were if you were to take a drink of sheep milk and take a drink of cow milk, what can you is there a way to describe the difference? Like what would I, what would we expect? I tell people it's like drinking half and half. It's almost twice the protein as cow milk and twice the fat as cow milk. Oh, 
So we really kind of target um, artisan cheese makers because that is a really super desirable milk for making cheese. So obviously you can drink it and you can make yogurt or caramel or I mean sour cream. You can do all the things with it just like cow milk. It's just more desirable for people that are trying to make these specialty cheeses. Okay, that makes sense. And um, is it, I know like cow milk, it the cream rises to the top, but my understanding of, sh- of goat milk is that it's naturally, is it homogenized where it stays okay. together? Is that how sheep yep. is too? Is it, it's, is it naturally mixed together? Yep. Okay. So you're not going to skim the cream off of the top of your sheep milk like you would with cow milk? No, you can, you can let it sit in your fridge or whatever for five days is probably ideal um and you can you can skim the cream off of that and make butter i've done it before i've done it lots so you just have to wait a little bit longer or you can get a cream separator obviously okay well that's that's pretty cool so is the the process though works the same so they would come to you and um, and they would like pay you a fee and then they would pay every month. So they, just to kind of explain herd shares, if they haven't, we did talk, we've talked about herd shares before, but um, the way that they work is um, you pay a fee and that kind of buys you into the herd. So now you own a portion of that herd, but then for right. upkeep of that herd, the way to, to kind of legally get milk is um, what you're not, you're not actually buying gallons of milk or quarts of milk. You're actually paying for the upkeep and you get your, your like reward, I guess. I don't know what else your um, is that you get a portion of what they make. So, um, so in your herd share, you're buying into the herd, you're maintaining the herd and you get milk and the way of keeping track of your maintenance is paying X amount of dollars and you get this number of gallons of milk. And on a yep. weekly basis or bi-weekly basis or whatever. And it's completely exactly. 100% legal. Yep. Just like that. Yeah. Just exactly like that. Okay. So, um, okay. So have you made ice cream out of sheet milk? Yes. Is it good? Yep. Seems like it would be really, really ex- like extra creamy. Um. Well, the way that they make ice cream is, I mean, you use milk and then you use like a fair amount of cream. Right. So I just use straight sheep milk. And so it's a little bit harder. It's not quite as you kind of have to let it thaw, sit out and thaw a little bit before you scoop it. But that's just how I make it because I want to use I want to use all the milk. I don't want to have to add heavy whipping cream to it. So but that's that's how you would make it more like scoopable is to add more fat. Yeah, that makes sense. OK. All right. So, um, how this, I'm going to, I'm going to preface this question with a story. So, and I can't remember the name of the book, but I will look it up and I'll put it in the show notes. And I know you said you wanted to know the name of the book because the story is kind of funny. Um, the people, um, some, I was reading a story about a family that got into farming. They decided they were going to farm sheep. So they bought a bunch of sheep and were starting their, um, their wool sheep business and when they had the shearer come out, the shearer said, um, you can do this, but these really aren't, um, what would you call them? Wool sheep or whatever. I don't, I don't know what the term is, but these, the, their, their wool isn't the greatest. Um, these are meat mm-hmm. sheep <laughs> and they had no idea. So they'd bought this, all these sheep, they started their business. They're doing all these, um, you know, they've got all this stuff going to only to find out. So that's how they accidentally ended up in the meat sheep business. It's a great story. Um, but how do you, like, how would you tell what, what makes a good, and I know this isn't because you don't, you don't, you're not on the wool side much, but what makes a, a good wool sheep um, versus a good meat sheep? I'm assuming meat, they have more meat on them. Yep. That's pretty much, um, I have lots of friends that raise fiber animals, fiber, fiber. sheep, and um, they're just like, your, your goals are just a little bit different. And so, I mean, you can still eat them. I mean, you can still I mean, do all the things with them. So it's just um, the fine wool is really soft. And the sheep generally, 
I'm going to sound super ignorant because I don't have fiber animals. Well, I have one and she's uh, a farm oddity because anyway, we ended up with her. We love her to pieces, but um, she's my one fiber animal. She is really soft, but she's, um, she's wrinkly. We shear our own sheep. Um, they all, we put them up on the stand. We don't roll them under their butt or anything like that. And we just shear them as they're standing there. And you can't really do that. We found out with fiber animals because they're wrinkly, because obviously if you have more skin, you can grow more wool. And if you grow more wool, you get paid more. That's so, true. Which completely makes sense. But it's funny. She's got all these little funny wrinkles on her. And so it makes it, I mean, if you lay them down and roll them under their butt and shave them, you can keep the skin taut. So you, you're not going to accidentally nick them. Whereas when you put them up on a stand like we do, they get nicked just because that's just not how the clippers are made. And that's not how you shear sheep, but that's how we shear sheep. So that's, that's the main difference to me. And they're, yeah, they're really soft. They're built a little differently. And, um, they, I don't know. They're just not like meat sheep. Yeah. Meat sheep, think... yeah, meat sheep they grow big and they grow fast and yeah, they can really pack on the pounds. Yeah, that makes sense. And for lack of a better description, probably a meat sheep is a little beefier. Like they yeah. usually kind of have more meat on their bones, I guess for, I don't know, but yeah. That yeah makes it's, sense. it's the same for like, if you look at like a dairy cow and a beef cow, I mean, they're yep completely different yep but you can you can use them for either um yep. okay so what do sheep eat eat, eat hay like that's most it other cows and horses and all the other farm critters um we give ours grain when we're flushing them so right before breeding time you want them to um, ovulate as much as possible and you want them to twin. Well, at least we do. Some people don't. And um, so you increase their nutrition. So we do that right before breeding. And then again, the last month or two before they lamb. So usually if they're full of babies, it's hard for them to take in enough nutrition just from hay because it's bulkier to sustain themselves and their lambs mm -hmm. and if you're not careful with that then use can crash from not getting enough nutrition okay that makes sense all right so what special care do sheep need in the winter they don't really need a whole heck of a lot they don't need a heated barn they just like to burrow down in the straw and have a draft free area. I mean, a lot of times here, they'll just not even lay in the barn. They'll lay like in the, in the shelter of the barn, you know, away from the windy side, but usually they're just scattered about laying in the snow because they're all, well, usually they're pregnant. So they, <clears throat> they stay a little bit warmer with that added bulk. And then obviously they have almost full fleece. And so they're they're usually pretty toasty, which is pretty nice. Like we have these cold spells where it's minus 25 or whatever. Like, I mean, other than I have to fight with the water to make sure the water is staying thawed for them. They're just totally fine. No problems whatsoever. They get frosty, but they're just out there loving life. Well, that's pretty great. So so if a person, so I'm, I'm going to take a step backwards for a second, because um, I know that one of the main reasons that people don't invest in a milk cow is just simply the cost, the cost of feeding the cow and the cost of acquiring the cow now, holy moly, and then feeding them. Um, and then you get way too much milk. So how much milk do you get out of a sheep? Sorry, I'm going backwards for a second. How much milk do you get out of a sheep on a daily basis? Well, they're not dairy sheep. And so they don't give very much. I try to tell people it's kind of like milking an Angus. It's not what they're designed for. Right. Designed to grow big fat babies fast. Okay. And so I milk them. They don't give very much. They don't give it readily. No. They, have it. they make you work for it. And um, 
and it's not for as long a period. So I usually only, I think I milked for about six months last year. And this year I'm only milking for about three. Oh, wow. And, and usually they're pretty easy to dry off because they don't want to give you the milk anyway. And so <laughs> they're like, totally fine. Leave me alone. But, um, yeah. So if it was like a dairy animal, just same as cows, you know, you would milk them for about 10 months and then, you know, give them a couple months off a dry period before they calve again. So, so how many gallons do you, or half gallons, or, I mean, I don't know how much, like a day and in one milking, how much do you get from one sheep? It's not very much. I don't even want, it's embarrassing so the amount of milk I don't get for the amount yes. of work that it is so and and every sheep is different like I have a couple um ewes that are just little powerhouses because they were not bred for this but they give quite a bit and so I'm happy with what I get so right now I'm milking three okay and I'm only getting I milk twice a day and I only get a half gallon a day Wow. So that's far different from, but if a, per, are, is there such thing as dairy sheep? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so then a person, do you, I, this is off the cuff. What, how much milk would a dairy sheep give more like, more like a half a gallon per sheep a day maybe, or, or do you even know? I don't think so that's what I've read and studied. We actually, um, last year and the last year, the year before, we have AI'd our meat sheep with dairy sheep semen. Oh, okay. So uh, we have, last year we got all boys, which was super disappointing. And that's just, that's just life. Yes, you it know, is. You, you, when you want girls, you get boys. And when you want boys, you get girls. It's, to, it's totally fine. You just roll with it. And um, so this year we actually got a couple of girls. So we have a couple of girls that we're going to retain that are half dairy, half Suffolk. Okay. So I plan on milking them next year and we'll see how it goes. I mean, it's just a grand experiment. That's I just, I'm, it's just a grand experiment. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm making it up as I go. I read things. I try to educate myself. But yeah, we'll see how it goes. But I want to say if you had like a straight dairy you, she could probably give you three quarters to a gallon a day. I mean, that's a lot. Wow. Yeah, that is a lot. Yeah, that's for them. And I want to say crossbred, the crossbred ewes are probably going to give like half that. I don't know. I really have no expectations. I just want them to get on the stand and be happy about it. I just okay. don't. You know, I don't want it to be stressful for them or myself, but, um, yeah, we'll see where it goes. An advantage I feel like to, um, and this isn't pitting against goats cause I love goats. My, my son and daughter-in-law have goats and they're going to have baby goat. I'm going to have grandbaby goats. They're so cute. But, um, but an advantage to, to sheep over goats is that sheep don't tend to test fences. Is that right? Yeah, they'll stick their heads through. If, I mean, if there's something desirable on the other side, but they don't jump. They don't climb on things. They, um, I don't want to say it sounds bad, but I want to say they're not as friendly. I mean, they're not all, I mean, I our sheep are friendly. We handle them all the time. They've all been to the fair. They've all been shown. They've um, been around. Lots of people, lots of times, halter broke, all the things, and um, they're just more aloof. They're kind of like the difference between dogs and cats. Like goats are like, they're so curious about what you're doing and what you're up to and that kind of thing. And sheep, they're curious and they want their scratches and stuff, but, but then they're like, oh, that's enough, thanks. Okay, well, that makes which, sense. Which works for me because... It, it's just nice. They're just like, oh, okay, they're going, they do their own thing. And so I had, I don't know what breed of sheep I had, um, but I had a sheep. His name was Barney um, in high school. The, the place that we were, we used to manage a ranch when I was growing up and um, the owner of the ranch brought Barney out one day and, and dropped him off. And um, Barney became my very best friend. 
Um, and Barney was very personable. He loved it when I would come home, we'd hang out together. Um, mm -hmm. I had Barney and then I had my horse biscuit that I had um, from the time I was a little girl. So I had, I kind of had two, I had a idyllic childhood probably <laughs> because, because I did have all these critters and, um, but um, Barney was just a great, he was, he was just my best friend. So I, I think I told you that I would take my, um, I'm not sure if I've confessed this to my mom. So if mom, if you're listening, here's a story <laughs> from my childhood. Um, I remember our lunch was a dollar and 25 cents um, at the, to buy a school lunch. And I never got the lunch because I would get a um, bag of a small bag of Doritos and a soda out of the vending machine instead. And I would bring those home and Barney and I would share the Doritos and the soda every day after school. And that's kind of, that was kind of our hangout time. And I'd tell Barney about my day and he always pretended to listen and whatever, but, um, that's so it, it was really fun and he was very personable, but he also didn't have any other sheep friends. Like he had biscuit, but, um, he didn't really ever bond with biscuit biscuit had his own, had his herd of, of horses that he hung out with and, um, you know, we had dogs and stuff, but Barney didn't really have anybody to bond to. So, um, so this brings me to this question. Um, if you have a sheep, is it best to have more than one sheep or are they, can they herd with other animals or what, what is their preference? I think they would rather be with more sheep. It's always nice to have two. We did have, when we first started out, we just had one pet sheep but she stayed out with the horses and she hung out. I mean, so there was lots of barnyard activity going on. So I don't think she really felt alone. I don't know. It's not like she bad uncontrollably or anything like that. She seemed pretty, pretty happy, but I think, yeah, it'd be better to have two, especially if you had no other farm animals, but like I had a horse and we had chickens and the girls were always out taking care of their bunnies or whatever and so there was so and she was the only sheep so like oh we need to take the dog on a walk oh we'll take the sheep too and so she got she got attention so but ideally yeah I would think too definitely then they can kind of cuddle and fight and whatever and do herd and things. do their sheep things that's right <laughs> exactly that's exactly right all right. So when do you breed your sheep? And then to follow up with that question, um, is lambing season really in February? And if so, how do you keep everybody warm and safe? <clears throat> lambing season, I mean, they're um, seasonal breeders and they start coming into heat around mid to late August here. And um, I know not all sheep are like that. I want to say the fiber breeds can breed year round. Oh. And, um, but most of the other sheep, dairy included, they're seasonal breeders and people usually breed from like September to Christmas or something like that. We have had lambs as early as mid-December. So they, we had land, so they were bred like the beginning part of August, which is like probably the absolute earliest you could do. I'm not sure if you could like tweak the lights in your barn or darkness, fake darkness or something like that to bring them, start bringing them into cycling. And then we've bred them all the way up to like mid January. So, but that's probably, that's like the span of what you could probably breed them. Okay, and how long is their gestation? Their gestation is about five months. It's like 147 days, 145 days. Okay. Somewhere and then, we just about five months. Okay, and you, so you do have lambs in the middle of winter in the coldest time of year. What what do you have to do anything special for them? Um. Well, we have cameras in the barns so we can watch them. We just make sure we take really good care of when they're bred. Our ram wears a marking harness. So it's like a wax crayon that sits right here on his chest. And so when he breeds the ewes, then they get marked. And um, they're, so we usually, we mark it down. We have a, a pretty good idea of when they've been bred and then we watch them to see if they get rebred. We keep them with the ram. And so then 
you know, we know when to like watch them and some use like they look really ready for a really long time and you're just constantly like watching the camera <laughs> and then other ones they don't look ready at all and you're like well this is when she was marked and I'm not sure and then just like you better be on it you better make sure that they're in the barn in that straw otherwise they'll have them outside oh, so gosh. and if they have um, them outside I assume you need to move everybody in because they the yeah. babies aren't insulated like their moms right yeah, yeah exactly so we have had them born outside we have been so so blessed that we've not had any casualties from anything like that we have lambed when it was minus 25 super stressful don't recommend we don't have any heat in our barn it's just the camera and we watch lots and lots of dry deep bedding and then as soon as they're born we've only had actually a couple born like in the middle middle of the night but again we have cameras so we watch them and usually you can hear like they cause a ruckus when they're when they're born or whatever and it's kind of nice because it's almost like an alarm like you better get your carcass out of bed because we're going to have lamb sickles real soon if you don't get out here <laughs> yeah yeah for sure so they usually have twins and so they'll have one and we'll let them clean them off i mean i realize it's really cold but it's super critical to get them bonded so we leave them for like i mean we're out there with them like 10 or 15 minutes as soon as they start acting like they're getting cold whether they've drank or not um we get them inside usually by then the mom has had a second one so she's cleaning off the second one we grab the first one we bring it in the garage we get them all dried off super super dry hair dryer the whole nine yards and then we put on a little wool coat and so they have a little coat on them that is made of wool and so then we stick them back out there and usually if they stay fed and their moms are smart and keeps them in the barn or we do have a creep where they can go it's like a little it's like a little space just for lambs it's got a small little door and we try to like teach them to go in there like this is where the heat lamp is and they have extra thick bedding grain if they want it they usually don't start eating grain till they're about a week or two old and um, they figure out pretty quick especially the ones that are born a little bit later so they have older lambs that are like hey we're gonna go in here and then they all just kind of like make a little lamby pile and they all pile in there under the heat lamp which is hung real high real secure so they can't knock it down or play with it because they will. And <laughs> that's that's where they go. I mean, the moms are fine because they have like this much wool all the way around their body. But right. we have to make sure that the lambs and usually they're just fine. We've not had any problems with anybody getting, you know, too cold or hypothermic or anything like that after they've been born. We've been super blessed. Good. I love that. So if someone is interested in getting sheep, um, what are some things that they, sh that they should know before getting started? Um, they are just like any other animal, like a pet or something like that, only more so. Like you can't, especially, I mean, if you have a pet sheep and you just want them to like mow the grass or whatever, that's way, way, way easier than trying to raise breeding animals where you have to like, you kind of have a, a schedule where like, okay, we, this is when we need to deworm. This is when we need to shear. This is when we need to breed. And you don't have to breed, you don't have to breed early fall so you have lambs in the middle of winter like I think next year we might actually breed like late fall like around the end of October and then we'll have lambs like the end of March I mean you can and most of my friends do that they breed a little later and then they have lambs you know this time of year so it's and not quite so stressful well, that makes sense. And in a typical year, not this year, but in a typical year, by the end of March, we're starting to get rid of the snow. We're not piling up new snow. <laughs> so that makes exactly. a lot of sense. Um, so uh, 
I think that that was about all of the questions that I had for you, but I do want to talk a little bit about 4-H before, before we finish up. So um, can you, can you just kind of tell us a little bit about what it's like to do 4-H with sheep? Um, just kind of, yeah, just whatever you, you know, that would be helpful if people are considering it. I think it's, it's probably too late to get a 4-H animal this year, but um, maybe if someone's considering it for next year. Right, so if you wanna do sheep for 4-H, obviously you can have any kind of a pet sheep, you can take them to the fair, you can have a sheep project. You don't have to breed them, you don't have to, I mean, you can just use them, like I said, as a lawn mower, and this is like some kids walk the dog, I walk the sheep. I mean, it doesn't have to be a, like a super intense project. Now, if you wanted to do 4-H or FFA with the intent of, auctioning a market animal at the fair, then it's more intense. You have to have, yeah, you have to have your animals by a certain time. They have to be a certain weight at certain dates. You have to make sure you meet all the requirements, which there's quite a few of them. And I think we've done this 10 years, I wanna say. Hmm? 11 years. This is our 11th year. And um, I'm still like figuring things out and forgetting things. And I'm so thankful for the people in our lives that are like, hey, don't forget, you know, whatever is coming up. And it's like, oh, shoot. Yeah, I need to get that done or whatever. So, I mean, what's the 4-H motto or whatever? Learn by doing. I mean, <laughs> It's always learning, always learning. I think that's part of the beauty of 4-H, which is huge. I, I We love the 4-H program. Um, we didn't ever did, we did pigs with 4-H. Um, we didn't ever do sheep, but um, our older kids. But I think that's part of the beauty of just raising kids in this lifestyle is there's you're always learning something and you're not just always learning something, but you're constantly solving problems. I mean, yes. to be super transparent, when you and I were getting ready to start this video, I looked outside and I realized that Abby had, we now learned the chicken was egg bound. I've never, I've never watched the back end of a chicken when they're egg bound. That's yucky. Um, but I could see something was wrong. So we were trying to record and I've got this chicken out the window that's egg bound. And then I opened the door and I realized another chicken that we've been nursing for like, I don't know, three weeks, four weeks. Um, she just passed away. So um, that's kind of, you know, we had all these problems to solve and I'm <laughs> we're trying to record and um, the egg bound chicken, by the way, she's already solved it. The, the egg has been laid. I don't know exactly because I was here doing this, but she hey. came up to me a minute ago and showed me the egg. The egg is so I'm stuck. So whatever, whatever it is that she did in the bathtub. Um, but that's a huge, I wasn't there to help her because I was getting ready to do this and, um, and she's 12 and she took the initiative. She thought she knew what to do, but she looked it up to make sure she's got books. She's got the internet. She was able to, to feel confident. She took her chicken in, she took care of whatever needed to happen. I I'll hear the story in a minute. And then, um, and what a huge, um, what a huge accomplishment for her. And, um, even with the chicken that passed away, that chicken is, I don't know, like five or six years old. It's an old chicken. Um, we knew yeah. she wasn't, she, we knew she wasn't, wasn't long for, um, the Hogate farm, <laughs> but, but, um, and she, golly, I mean, Abby was giving her, um, she decided that her favorite treats were, um, coconut. I have like shaved coconut in bulk that I buy. So she'd take it out. And the only thing that chicken would eat was the coconut. And we just kind of, you know, we joke, she lived her last days out in the tropics. She lived in our yeah. greenhouse. Um, Jean let her in there until we put plants on the ground. So she's in a heated greenhouse eating coconut, like what any human would want to spend their last days <laughs> just like that. Aww. So, um, yeah, so, but I think that just this life is important. It's, it's real and it's tangible and sometimes it ends bad, you know, I mean, you know, this, this chicken just passed away and her name was Willow and we've had her for a long time and, you know, we all loved her. So, um, but sometimes it ends well. And, and, you know, in that same moment, we had this chicken that I don't know what happened, whatever happened with her egg. And then Abby was helping her to lay, able to help her lay her eggs. So, 
Um, and that's part of what 4-H I think teaches our kids is um, the, you know, there's the responsibility side. It teaches parents responsibility too, because two trips to the fair every single day, it's a lot, especially when you live a long ways from the fairgrounds, but, yeah. um, but it teaches responsibility. It teaches um, that some things are out of our control, um, but it also teaches them to have faith, to do their best that, and it, it teaches them what to do when this animal is completely dependent on you. So um, I just really, obviously, am. I think that 4-H is a great program. And uh, part of the reason Abby doesn't want to do 4-H is she stays out of the butchering side of things. We grow meat, chickens and stuff, and she doesn't really deal with those animals because she's just very sensitive and sweet and she's just not ready for that, which is fine. Um, so I love that 4-H also offers just an opportunity, like you said, with your, I could have taken Barney to 4-H and, Absolutely. you know, <laughs> he could have, he could have participated and, um, you know, it's just, it's neat that there's that opportunity for these kids. So, um, we're, we have an amazing, amazing, amazing 4-H program for kids up here. So I think it's, it's definitely something for people to consider. Um, one final thing about, um, sheep too, when, um, when you said they, you know, for years, they were like, um, they, they kind of come to you when they want their scratches and they're like, okay, I'll see you later. Um, Barney on the other hand, and I wonder if this isn't because he was the only sheep and because he was attached to me, but my dad was a log truck driver when I was growing up. And, um, my job on the weekends was to wash his log truck, um, every weekend. Cause he was very, he had a lot of chrome on it and that chrome had to look good come Monday morning. It would look, it was Oregon. So it would look awful by, you know, 10 o'clock Monday morning or whatever, but by golly, when he rolled out Monday morning, it looked good. And he, uh, and so Barney would help me and I'd get wet, Barney get wet. And every day when I sat every Saturday morning, I'd come back in the house and I'd go to stand by the stove. And because Barney was wet too, I'd always sneak Barney in and Barney would sit behind our wood stove and sit there and Pretty soon my mom would come out, get that filthy animal out of here. He's got poop in the house, she'd say. <laughs> so, but um, but I do think that um, I don't know. I think that for kids too, there's something special about having, you know, human friends, obviously, but there's something pretty neat about having livestock friends too. They they provide oh, yeah. a different form of friendship. So um, it's pretty cool. So um I really appreciate you taking some time and talking about sheep with us. I, I um, get asked on our, we have a Facebook group, Sustainable Alaska, and I, people have asked about sheep a couple times. So um, it's interesting to, to kind of dig into it a little more. If we want to reach out to you, if we, if somebody has questions or something, where, how can we find you? Absolutely. I'm happy to help whoever <clears throat> get into this addiction. <laughs> I'd be happy to be an enabler, but, uh, Rhymer's micro farm. We have our email. It's Rhymer's micro farm at gmail.com. And that's Rhymer's with an S on the end. And, um, we have a Facebook page, so you can send me a Facebook message, Rhymer's micro farm. And, um, I don't really want to post. I think my phone number is on the Facebook page. So if people want to reach out that way, if it's a really weird looking number, then I probably won't answer, but just leave a message and I'll probably call you back or text. There and you go. Um, yeah, just happy to help. I mean, I just, I just think sheep are the coolest animal. I mean, my girls raise beef cows now and I, I love them. They're hilarious. They all have their own little unique personalities and stuff, but I'm like, yeah, they don't try and kill you, they smash you up against the fence or something like that. You can usually, <laughs> you can usually tackle them and maybe be a little sore the next day, but you don't have to, usually you don't have to worry about going to the hospital. But anyway, I think they're, I just think they're pretty cool animals. Well, I think that's pretty neat, but I love the way that you got started and was for your kids. And then, you know, your kids kind of moved on and you're like, oh, I'm going to keep the sheep. <laughs> that's, that makes oh, that's, totally. They're my project now. Thanks that's guys. Right. We need adult 4-H. That's what we need. <laughs> I know. I love going to like all the workshops and Sylvia was on a Zoom last night learning. Uh, she's raised pigs for many years and, um, like you can always learn more just talking to other farmers and stuff like that. You're always, I'm always watching 
webinars or getting books or reading articles, you know, for the latest and greatest information on, you know, management or nutrition or, you know, all kinds of things. Totally. Just, and probably part, I have to give a plug for homeschooling because I kind of picked 4-H because I wanted an activity that we could do. I didn't want to be like running to soccer, running to ballet, running to art classes or anything like that. Although my, my girls did do stuff like that, but I, I picked 4-H because it's something we could all do together as a family and just trying to be efficient in with fuel or time or whatever. I was like, I think we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck doing something like this. And, and it's definitely paid off. I love that. Melissa, it's been great talking to you. This has been really fun. Uh, I definitely, I, I feel like the longer we talk, the more I'm like, I want a sheep. I want all the things. Everybody I talk to, I, it's like, I want one of each. <laughs> I know, right? It's been really fun to talk to you though. Thank you so much for taking the time. You're so welcome.